Hello, Ursula. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm fine, and it's great to be on this series, which has so many exciting people on it. Thank you. Very honored, of course, to have you here. I would love to hear your story. Well, my mother was a pianist, and obviously she was my biggest and first influence, and she was a very passionate musician, and music was just so much part of my household that I can't imagine anything different. But I have been thinking recently also a great deal about my first theory class, which was with a woman named Gretel Bamberger. And there was a bunch of five and six year olds. And we, you know, first of all, this was a chance for us to hang out with other five and six year olds. But she taught us, um, theory. She taught us that flats were more difficult than sharps. And we listened to Mo a Mozart opera. And I feel that theory for young children is absolutely wonderful. When I was a senior in high school, I was asked, do you know what you want to be professionally? And I said, I have no idea, but I'm certain I don't want to be a musician. So. So I really didn't know till I left home what my own choices were. It was finding my own, you know, because my father um, was a piano tuner and a musicologist and wrote a great deal about music. So music was so much in my home that I didn't know what the other possibilities were. You're the champion for new music. I wonder how you started that journey. Well, it seems to me to be kind of obvious that if you could actually work with someone who could tell you, well, I would like it to sound like this, that would be very exciting. You know, um, I can't ask Beethoven what, how loud the Sforzando should be. I really can't. He's, he's not around anymore. But I can ask John Corleano how, how loud this Sforzando should be. And he'll say, in this section of the piece, think of it this way. And it seemed that there was so, so many opportunities to work with people while they were alive that it would be crazy not to take advantage of them. And, you know, it's such fun to be able to work with someone who can tell you what he or she had in mind or what sounds she had in mind. So it was, it wasn't a big leap for me. When you work with composers, do you often give them feedback on the writing or you basically just receive the score then you play? Mainly I play it what I receive. I mean, the composers I know are all supremely good at their profession, you know? And we also know from the music of the past that different markings can have different meanings. So if one composer writes an accent and another composer writes a sforzando, I don't say they all have to be exactly the same because they're in the context of the music of each composer. Very often, there are slight revisions between the first um, score and the end, but they're mainly revisions that have to do with um, accidents or omissions. You know, they're just the kind of revisions. They aren't very big. So the composers I work with really know how to write music. Students often say that it's rather hard to understand the rhythm of new music. Well, there is a school of music called the New Complexity, where the rhythms really are very difficult. And one has to figure out whether these complex rhythms should remain foreign or should become part of what one can hear. 
one of the issues that goes on throughout history is rubato. Um, there's rubato in all, in basically all music of the past and the present. Do you want to notate rubato, or do you want to assume that people will follow the natural phrasing of a line? And the best, well, one example of this is the Berg Sonata, from which, you know, has move forward, hold back, move forward, move forward, move forward again, hold back. But you also have the music of Brian Ferniu, which has very strict um, notation in terms of subdivisions of the beat, and they are very hard to follow. And apparently Fernie really knows what he's doing. So is that a form of rubato or is it something that goes against the natural flow of music? One has to find out in each piece. Um, generally, the subdivisions, the rhythmic subdivisions you find in music are not more difficult than the arithmetic you had in fourth grade. So if you could do fourth grade, you can basically do the rhythmic things. But if you couldn't do fourth grade, that's another story. For someone who has not ex been exposed to a lot of music, do you have a set of a repertoire or list of composers that can help them to ease into that new music world? Well, we have I mean, I would say the our age, this age we're living in, and it's been going on for quite a while, is one of multiple styles. You know, that there isn't one style of music. In 1880, you could say, yes, high romanticism was the style, and you could more or less hear when a piece was written. In 1980 or 2022, you can tell that a piece is probably written in this time, but it different pieces will sound completely different from one another. Um, Philip Glass and Jason Eckhart, they don't sound at all like one another. Um, that's kind of fun. And there's a lot of music being written for to play instruments in ways they are not traditionally played. This was, you could say, the grandfather of this school would be Helmut Lachenmann, but there are many, many people who are much younger who are writing for sounds that we don't expect. And a listener has to sort of come into a concert with open ears and say, I don't know what I'm going to hear. But I'm curious, you know, I think that's the attitude for listening to new music. You can't, many years ago, I was at a concert, a violin and piano concert. And first there was the spring sonata and the person in front of me snored. Then there was a new piece by a living composer and the same person walked out. Well, I think neither snoring nor walking out is a good idea. It didn't matter whether he snored or walked out. In either case, in neither case was he listening to the music. When you pick up a, a repertoire, whether it's a Bach or whether it's a Beethoven or whether it's a new music, how do you get yourself started? What's that process for you? If it's something I really don't know and something complicated, for quite a while, I just read it each day and for maybe a week, it feels like I never saw it before, even though I read it yesterday. And then after about a week of just reading it and at, making no demands on myself, you know, just play it, play, plod through it, it, it starts to become familiar. And I start to, um, know that this chord goes to that chord. I start to begin to be able to make fingerings, which I don't, you know, that first first five or six times through a piece, 
I don't ask anything because I know, maybe I know now at my age, that eventually it will become familiar even if I don't try to actually learn anything in the first few days. By now, most pieces that were written in the past, I've heard, you know, but there are still composers, you know, we don't know. I mean, they're great composers, Lyapunov, Simonovsky, of, you know, that we don't know all the music of by any means. The harmony is important, but I don't try to analyze it right away. But after five or six times through it, I will recognize it. And that becomes something that I can hang on to. So I, I would say for a student, you have to be willing to have these few first times, each time seem as if you never saw it before. And that's very frustrating. I read through it yesterday. I read through it the day before yesterday. And it still seems completely unfamiliar. And I think that's normal. And one just has to have that amount of patience. Well, the important thing is to play through the piece, not to stop, not to let your mind wander, um, to really try to see how you can get from the very beginning to the very end in one take, you know, in one, like the movie camera one, in one take. And the first times you try to do it, you'll probably, you may fail. And that's why you do it ahead of the performance. And where you fail are the really interesting points, because that might be something that you thought you knew, but you don't know. Or where you get tired, and you're not used to getting tired in the middle of a performance, because when you practice, when you get tired, you just take a break. So I think preparing for a performance really means try performing ahead of time. You can perform just for yourself. You can perform for your friends or your parents. You can perform for your tape recorder. But, you know, just perform in certain situations where if you make a mess, it's okay, but you'll find out where you make your mess. This is a, something I, I'm also curious about. When you um, engage different personalities, each student has their own learning journey. How do you cultivate that individuality? Um, basically, I, I support what they're doing. I ask them to be quite careful with learning the notes. I mean, I really don't accept a casual attitude to that. But once they have learned the notes, I'm very interested in what they do with them. So that even if a student does something I had never thought of, it's often very exciting to me. And um, I try I don't demonstrate very much, so, um, but I do want them to understand that the phrase goes from here to there and respond, you know, not to stop in the middle of a phrase, let's say, or maybe to stop to show a high point, but to know what they're doing in relationship to what is there, what can be defined and usually they do it their own way yes i mean they have their own sound their own how much they slow down at the end of a phrase um that's up to them you've um, accomplished amazing things in life what are your dreams for the future <laughs> right now my next two concerts are very exciting for me one is playing a quintet that Tanya Leon wrote a few years ago for the Cassatte Quartet and myself. And 
there's going to be a big symposium about, about her. Just relearning the quintet is so exciting because I'm hearing the harmonies again, which I'd forgotten and how interesting they are and things like that. And the concert the very next day is a memorial concert for Frederick Shevsky, which um, will be in LA and there'll be 23 pianists playing. It's a basically afternoon and evening concert. And I'll be playing the last piece he wrote for me, which is called Friendship. Um, and the meaning of that title has kind of transformed my life in the two years since it was written. Because I've, as you know, even my program for you is going to be called Friendship. Because I think, and this was a piece written during the pandemic when friends could not see each other. He was in Belgium, I was in New York. Um, I didn't, I was just amazed at the title of the piece. You know, I was so moved. So these are my immediate exciting projects, you know. After that, I'm not exactly sure what will be going on, you know. I haven't, I haven't thought that far, but, um, Yes, the pandemic had, there were two pieces, Friendship by Frederick Shevsky, and also the pianist composer Michael Brown wrote a forehand piece for myself and my partner, Jerry Lowenthal, who's been on your program, because we were allowed to play together because we're partners, we were in a pod together. But so we had something really wonderful come out of the pandemic. That sounds exciting. Extremely excited about this uh, mini course. That friendship actually caught my attention because it's such an unusual title and beautiful title. I'll be playing the music of my friends. And, you know, when you asked why I play the music of living composers, it is because they're my friends. And um, to have the personal connection as well as the musical connection is just kind of what's made my life so wonderful and that's why but I hadn't really thought of it till Frederick wrote that piece that's beautiful Ursula thank you